Amen. So, according to the um, experts, we have uh, different love languages that uh, different ones of us uh, best hear love when it's communicated through a certain language. Some of us, uh, the love language that best communicates to us is words of affirmation. Somebody taking the time to stop and say, you're doing a great job. I'm proud of you. Your, uh, your gift is making a difference. The significance of your life is very important. And the encouragement is what makes you feel loved. For some of us, apparently it's touch. To be hugged or, you know, to hold hands or um, maybe greeting one another with a holy kiss. Uh, these things are the way that, that you feel love. Which one is it for you? For some of us, it's acts of service. Somebody who takes the time to do something for you, goes out of their way to, to, uh, to do some work on your behalf, to care for you, to, to do something that maybe was difficult for you to do, or you just feel like you're having a hard time and just takes a little bit of load off of your, your, uh, uh, your plate. That is what it is that makes you feel loved. For some of us, it's just spending time with one another. And if somebody will just come and be with you and spend time with you, talk with you, share together, it makes you feel like, you know what? These people, this person really loves me and really cares for me. What is it that is your love language? It's interesting to me how different all of us are. Uh, the last one is gifts. Some of us, and the people that talk about this, the guys that talk about this, say that this is an exhaustive list. That all of us fits on this list somewhere that, that what makes us feel loved is when somebody does these kinds of things on our behalf. So for some of us, it's gifts. If somebody takes the time to give us a gift, no matter how big, no matter how small, you come away saying to yourself, wow, man, <laughs> that just really meant so much to me. The reality is that most of us can tend to fall into trying to love others the way that I most feel loved. There's an inherent reality that we face sometime in our growing up years that we realize not everybody is like me. Not everybody does things the way that I do them. Not everybody uh, is inclined towards the kinds of things that I'm inclined to. And it can be a little bit scary growing up because, right, that's the moment where you start feeling like I'm all alone. I'm different from everybody. Nobody wants to be around me. What's wrong with me, right? We've all been in those moments as we're growing up where we're trying to figure out who we are and what we are. I've talked to somebody recently that they grew up in a family that um, it sounds like they almost never felt not loved and not cared for. And they came out with, with a deep sense of self-esteem that, that they literally uh, figure if somebody's talking about them behind their back, it's got to be good stuff because they just feel so good about themselves, right? Uh, apparently, there are people that were raised with that kind of strength of love in their home and their background. <laughs> it's amazing to me. I, I, that wasn't the case for me, though my parents were very loving and very caring. But we've been talking for the last four weeks. This is the fourth week, the last three weeks and then this week, on this issue of love from whatever to forever. We recognize that we all come from brokenness in our backgrounds at different levels. And, you know, uh, just recently, um, I was talking with a bunch of pastors, and they reminded me of something that I'd heard uh, in, in, a, um, in a leadership training session for charities in Frederick, put on by Osherman Foundation. And they had this generational session that had to do with with how is it that we 
um, continue to, to raise up people to help with charities uh, through the generations. And we walked in there and it was amazing to me that what they were talking about was the fact that the X generation, my generation has not shown up when it comes to helping out with charities. That they seem to, to not care, they seem to not be motivated. And literally like they were, the, the charities were ignoring my generation and looking to the generation following for help because it seems like my generation in particular just is not interested in trying to make a difference with the, with the, the, the big needs that are in society. They have kind of a whatever mentality. They said about us when we were younger that we were latchkey kids. You know, that our parents were off chasing dreams of whatever it is that was important to their lives, and there was a sense that we kind of got left behind. And so, you know, we were going to fight for our right to party, you know, and we're going um, uh, to tell the teachers, hey, teachers, leave us kids alone. You know, there's a sense that, of alienation that was in our generation that we didn't feel like our parents really cared for us and loved us. So much so, this is the case, that when it came time for our generation to have their own kids, what did they do? They held off. They're like, I'm not doing it unless I can do it right. And then once they started having kids, what did they do? They were helicopter parents. They were so committed to their families and so committed to being at every game and everything that's going on that they were like the antithesis of what the previous generation's reputation was about our generation. Everything shifted. Everything changed. And this is the reality is that as a result of that, our generation, when it comes to church, or when it comes to anything that has to do with, you know, like larger societal coming together community, our generation is not so good at it. I literally was just a few weeks ago talking with a bunch of uh, pastors of pastors, meaning these are guys that have started several congregations and oversee several congregations, and they brought some of the uh, pastors with them, and they're talking about what's happening in our generation, and at the top of the list with everybody from my generation was this recognition that our generation is absent at some level, feeling like they're just not motivated to connect with the body of Christ or with the community, you know, so it's not just in the body of Christ, but it's like society-wide. And yet, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians is calling the people of Corinth to being the body of Christ, to, to, to caring for one another and not just living their own separate lives. It was so bad in 1 Corinthians that when they got together for communion, some people would get drunk and other people would like eat a whole meal and other people would go hungry and have nothing to eat in the context of communion. They clearly celebrated communion a bit differently from how we do it this time. But there's there's a whole number of different things. You know, they were arguing over, should I follow Peter? Or should I follow Paul? Or should I follow God? Through, should I follow Jesus Christ? Like there were these kinds of arguments going on so that Paul takes the first four um, chapters of Corinthians dealing with <laughs> that they, they just need to accept all these different guys. And the result is that we live in a generation that says this kind of thing. Uh, people are different. You just got to accept people for who they are. We got to be tolerant of one another. Right? Just like the Corinthians. The Corinthians were full of sin and full of brokenness. Paul spends chapters 5 through chapter 9 just dealing with all the different sins and the ways that the, the Corinthians were just not letting any uh, sense of righteousness guide their actions. They just seem to to, to be struggling to, to recognize that there are certain limits, similar to the generation that we live in right now. Keep your morality to yourself. That's your truth. That's not my truth. 
And yet this is the generation that we live in. This is where we are right now. And when Paul was speaking that to the Corinthians, Paul, in the midst of the brokenness, caused the Corinthians to lift up their eyes and to see what it is that God intends. Not that there be all this division, not that there be uh, all of us just living our lives separately, but he calls them to something higher. And the language that he uses is the language of the body of Christ. That we would move from whatever with our whole generation. Listen, what the Spirit of God is doing today in building families is, I think, something that will, will carry on for several generations. Right? We'll become grandparents and even great-grandparents and the, the things that the Lord is teaching us about the importance of, of our families and caring for our families is going to carry on. And, and we'll be uh, standard bearers, I think, for generations. But our kids are going to end up growing up with a whole different set of issues that they got to face in the Spirit. But we got to face what we're facing today. A generation that is a whatever generation that seems to have not shown up at this stage of the ball game to community. And instead are doing their own things, and even when it comes to family, they're really good at raising their family. In fact, they're raising their kids so well that it's probably the case that our kids will end up going a lot farther and maybe even be a lot more involved with all of society than we ever were because we've taken the time to love them and to care for them. And that is righteous and godly. It's very important in the purposes of God. So Paul starts out. Well, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 together. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our pre presentable parts, oh, they have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 
And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret but eagerly desire the best gifts? And yet I will show you a more excellent way. And that's when he goes into 1 Corinthians 13. In this passage, Paul starts out with two sets of divisions that I'm not going to get into right today. The first set of divisions is this reality that there's a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those of you that are in the CV Chapel 101, you know that we, we base the whole CV Chapel 101 around this idea. The body of Christ in a, in a broad way has split since the late 1800s around the, the Trinity. Some that magnify the greatness of God the Father who is sovereign of all things. Those that magnify the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is present in our lives and giving us gifts and changing, uh, empowering us to minister to one another. And those that magnify Jesus Christ that, that are out saying that we just need to preach the gospel and we need to keep with it. The reality is that the body of Christ has split around these things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but it's a reality. And Paul's recognizing that they're all the same. And then he goes on, there's Jew and Greek and slave or free. And again, we can still to this day see those divisions. Anti-Semitism is just as strong today as it ever was. The black, white thing in the United States, it's amazing how strong it is in our day. And whatever it is that are your conclusions about how people that are in power and have influence are handling those things, the bottom line is that they're still divisive. And in the body of Christ, when I talk to those that are African American, the reality is that they're not sure that I'll take the time to hear their perspective on how things have been going in our nation. The reality is that that divide still requires us to walk in the unity that Christ has wrought on our behalf. When's the last time you've had that kind of conversation with somebody that is a believer that happens to be on the other side of some of the the issues of today. We need to step into it. But what I want to deal with today is this next section on gifts. And then where he deals about caring for one another. In this whole section on the body sometimes saying, oh, I'm not important. Or maybe sometimes saying other people aren't important. To look at these and to hear the voice of the Spirit of God. To hear God, Jesus Christ, who has made us his body. We are the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, he wants, you know, I, I exercise a couple times a week. I'm trying to do my best to keep myself in shape, right? Dewey gave me a device that is a torture device. And uh, I uh, diligently torture myself with it, beat my body and make it my slave, right? But if my hand, the other day I was doing, you know, a push-up type thing where, where my feet are in the uh, torture device, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to do something that is designed to bring maximum pain to this part of uh, my, my core, and, uh, and my hand was hurting, right? And I was like, oh, no, you know, I, I got to be careful with that, you know, and so I stopped what I was doing just to pay attention to it, right? Now, sometimes you just got to push through pain, but there's some pain that you don't push through it, that you need to stop and let it heal. There's two kinds of pain. The kinds of pain that you push through, you push through, and it hurts. But you're better for it in the long run. The kind of pain that you don't push through, if you push through, you're, you just end up ruining, you know, your joints or something like that. And you just got to, you need to stop and let them get healed, right? Well, Paul says that in the body, there are all these different gifts. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time teaching about the different gifts, but I do want us to see the different ones uh, that, that he's referring to here and to, to get a basic gist of, of what they're like. He says wisdom. Apparently, well, before I get into that, he says the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the, for the purpose of blessing all. My sense in this passage is that Paul is specifically referring to what happens when everybody is together. 
He's just come off talking about communion and how, how when they come together, they do things all wrong. And he's going to come out of this into chapter 13 about love, you know, and into chapter 14 about how some people, you know, just want to speak in tongues all the time, but there's no interpretation. And they seem to even like speak in tongues over top of one another, you know, like it's a competition. And, and, and so people go away not hearing encouragement in language that they understand, right? He's talking about what happens when they come together and he uses a specific phrase. He says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one individually for the purpose of blessing everyone. And so my sense is that on any given Sunday, on any given you, uh, home group, at any given time when we're together practicing hospitality with one another at each other's houses, that, that some of these different ones might pop up. And the point is, is that we're mutually submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this first one is wisdom, and maybe this time it'll be, it'll be uh, Betsy that brings the wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is, is that... that uh, um, that type of knowledge that helps us to think through the nuances of how you address something. Yes, I think you should go talk to that person about that issue, but I think you should do it with this kind of an attitude. And I think maybe you should start out by, by laying this foundation, and then when you share it, they're not coming away that, you know, with the sense that you're attacking them, right? Wisdom is, is understanding the nuances of how, to go, of how to apply the knowledge, how to apply righteousness in our interactions with one another, right? It's wisdom. How do you do what you do? Wisdom is also applied in the context of when I'm uh, trying to, um, just yesterday I asked Sean, uh, for a couple months I've had uh, these drawers that are broken, right? The, the, the front of it has come off, right? And I, I, I was like, all right, I'll take care of that. And so I got some screws and I, I fixed it. And promptly within like three or four weeks, it came right back off again. I just, you know, I, I didn't have wisdom to do it right. And, and for months, every time I go by that, I'm like, ah, oh, man, what I tried didn't work. Man, what do I do with that? Maybe I just need to buy some new ones. So I was looking at new ones that are like 40 bucks a drawer, you know, for the lowest end, you know, uh, of what it is. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, I've, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just build my own, you know. So, so, so now I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'll talk to Sean. I pull Sean over. I'm like, Sean, what do I do with this? He takes a look at it. He's like, well, you know, just kind of stick an L bracket inside there. I'm like, duh. What was I thinking, you know? It's just, but the point is, is that wisdom comes to do with knowing how to do what needs to be done, how to say what needs to be done. It's a gift. And on any given time coming together, that could come from Sadie. That could come from any one of us, right? Uh, the second one that he refers to is the uh, gift of knowledge, right? Knowledge just like wisdom. You know, whatever it is that we're talking about, somebody might speak up and say, you know, this is just like in church history when Martin Luther did this. Or somebody else would say, you know, uh, uh, I uh, was studying my biology the other day, and this is the way blood cells work, and it applies to, you know, what we're dealing with here, right? There's a, there's a gift of knowledge that, that can come forth, and, and it could come forth from every one, any one of us at any different time. There doesn't have to be one know-it-all that is the guy that, that does all of the speaking. That's even why we try to, from the pulpit, have different ones speaking on a regular basis. Because we're the body of Christ. It's not about a John cult. It's about the body being the body and ministering to one another. Though it is a John cult because there's only Johns that minister. If you want to preach at Crossroads, you have to get a good Christian name. And so, so praise God that the Lord has kept us pure like that. Lord, we give you glory for that. Thank you, we're not like those other churches that have Jeff preach. <laughs> so, okay, so, praise God. Uh, faith, 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 it's a gift. And it's definitely the case on any given occasion, any given Sunday, any given home group, that I'm not the one that's feeling so strong in faith. That instead, this time, it's Mickey. This time around, it's Jenna, where she just, she's got the faith. And as a result, I come away just thinking, you know what, Lord, forgive me. I was doubting you. But now, now I'm just reminded, you, you're going to take care of what needs to take care of. Because somebody spoke up and said, God's got it. I've been going through this thing, but I know God's in control. And you feel it in the way they say it. Connie has been this way for me for the last year and a half. 
man, it's been a hard run for her. But every time I talk to her, she, she's just got this confidence that God is working his will and that things are, are going to work out. And I come away blessed every time. Like, you know, I'm such a whiner. God, forgive me for whining so much and not trusting that you're going to take care of things. The gift of faith, we need it. Who is it today that spoke up with faith that you're feeling encouraged? Who is it today uh, that is here that you feel that faith and you need to speak up? And just say, you know what? I know that God's got this for us. He's called us. We're going to be okay. The gift of faith. The manifestation of the Spirit. He goes on to a gifts of healing. Yeah, gifts of healing. You know, and I, I, I think we should add to the gifts of healing. This is somebody that can tell when somebody's hurting. And so they're motivated and moved to step up and to go lay hands on and to just ask them how they're doing and to pray for them. It's a gift of healing. Any given Sunday, any one of us could manifest this, that, that we're just sensitive to it. Some of us, with all of these gifts, I think different ones of us have um, more inclination in one direction or, or another, right? I think some of us tend to be the wisdom guys. Some of us tend to be the knowledge guys. Some of us tend to be the sensitive guys. But on any given Sunday, it could be any one of us that is making this happen. Workers of miracles. <laughs> Paul included in his list of the manifestations of the Spirit that could happen on any, on any given occasion when we get together. Workers of miracles. Right? The, the sense of somebody with the faith that knows that God can move. And he's going to work a miracle here in our midst today. He's going to do something that we did not think was possible. This is something that God wants to lift up our eyes that we would see what he sees. We serve a God who created the universe, who calls things that are not as though they are, that holds the heart of kings in his hand and directs it like a water course. He is the mighty God. And if he wants to work a miracle in our midst, let us show up prepared and expecting that God can do that today. And maybe you'll be the one that God uses. Going on, prophecy. Prophecy is so important, right? There's the prophets of the Old Testament, and those guys, their prophecies were written down, and they are scripture for us today. I'm not of the opinion that any one of you guys, when you go to prophesy, that we should write it down and that it's inspired scripture. And whenever anybody prophesies, it's very important for us to pull out the word of God and to uh, confirm that it lines up with the clear teaching of scripture right? We don't just prophesy whatever we feel, but we hold it to account. We judge it. This is what Paul talks about in, in, uh, in two chapters later in 1 Corinthians 14. But we need those people that can speak up to the, to, to the people of God or even to the, to the people that are not of God and say, if you continue the way that you're going, there's going to be judgment. Stop. Let the Lord pierce your heart and change you and call you to repentance. He wants you to be his people, to be his bride. Quit running away from him. Quit following other idols. Quit treating one another with injustice. Quit being rude to one another and come back to the purposes of God that he might bless you. We need those people in our midst that see the issues and that can say, I don't know why we keep doing this as a church. It's going to result in that. And that's not just a critical spirit in you. Maybe people that are prophetic in nature uh, uh, have a tendency in sin towards a critical spirit. That might be the case, right? In fact, that's true for all of these different gifts. Somebody with a compassion gift is the same kind of person that uh, might not be very good with boundaries and might end up walking over people's boundaries because they're so quick to care for people that are hurting that they don't, you know, they don't stop and and honor people's boundaries. It's the case. Some people are, are so compassionate that they end up being like a guy that's compassionate, being like a ladies' man, because he's so compassionate. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like, like different gifts that God has placed in the body are likely to have different sins associated with those that, that have that particular gifting. 
Do you hear that? And this is part of where I want to go today, that you've probably been hurt by somebody that, that consistently comes forth with these kinds of gifts in the past. You've been hurt by the sin side of what they deal with. The question I'm asking today is what is it that causes you to resist being open to those gifts in, in the body of Christ? To feel like you just don't want to hang with that kind of person because you know better. You know what kind of person they are. And instead of seeing the strength, the gift that God has placed in them, and the way that God is redeeming all of us, transforming us to be more like Christ, forgiving us of our sins, and causing us to walk in more righteousness today than we did yesterday, that there's a process. And so yes, that person that tends to use that certain gift also has that certain sin problem, and you've had that happen to you in the past, but does that mean that we should look at them in light of their sin problem and that's all that we see? Or should we see the gift that is there and ask the Lord to give us the vision of a redeemed body where that person is being helped to grow through their sin into the fullness of the gift that God has for them. And so instead of us just trying to poo-poo and to shut them down and to stay away in, in that thing that happens in our soul when we run across somebody that's like somebody that we know from before. And we're like, I don't know, man. I got a check in my spirit. <laughs> right? Sometimes the check in our spirit is just our soul. It's a check in our soul, not in our spirit. Thank you. That's good language. Right? We need to pay attention to those because we're the body of Christ and we need to build each other up in love. But the question is, do we receive the gifts that God has put in our midst as important to the body? He goes on. He deals with discerning of spirits, <laughs> right? Man, I hate being around somebody like that. They're so critical. They're always judging everything. Yeah, right? But there's more than just that in them. They have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they are part of the bride of Jesus, the glorious bride of Jesus Christ that is being washed by the water of the word of God that Jesus is speaking to, and the Lord, we need them in our midst. Hallelujah. We need people that can discern spirits, that can tell that something just came into our midst and there's something more going on and that we're paying attention to it and not letting it have free reign in our midst. We need those people. Listen, I'm the kind of guy that, that, uh, that loves, um, no, 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 that, that is a possibility thinker. I think we can do anything. But I need those people in my life that will say, John, I, I realize that you see a lot of positive for that person, you know, and that, that you really think that, that, that things are going good, but I'm discerning something. I need those people in my life that I can stop and say, you know what, I hear that. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to pray about that. Instead of saying, oh, man, you're, you're just so critical. You're so mean. You're so, you know, stop being that way. We need all of the gifts. Why? Well, at the end of the day, I could give you all kinds of biological reasons why we should do this and to prove to you that the body's the body. But why do we need to do it? Because God told us to. Because this is the message that Jesus has given to the church, that we be the church together. And then he talks about tongues. Some of us have the gift of tongues. Some of us have the gift of interpretation of tongues. It's very interesting that some have the tongue and the others have the interpretation of tongue. Uh, it could be a little bit disconcerting to somebody that's not paying attention to what's going on, that, that some have the interpretation and some have the tongue. Uh, Paul gets into that later on in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 where he says if there's not somebody there that can interpret, then don't speak in tongues, right? He's recognizing that, that there's a problem that could happen because this gift of tongues isn't always accompanied by the interpretation of the tongue. And so if we're going to bless one another in the body, then we need to recognize that sometimes those things show up separately and, uh, and, and not use your gift. Oh, man, look, he spoke in tongues. What a great guy he is. I mean, that's not the point of speaking in tongues. The point of the, all the gifts is that we manifest them for the benefit of one another. If people can't understand what you're saying, there's no benefit to them. So we need to make sure that people can understand so that they're edified and so that they can go home having been built up and encouraged in the Lord. Right? 
So I'm not, he, he basically has two other uh, lists, a list in 28 and 29. I'm not going to go into those lists, lists extensively now. But he's listing the different gifts and the different, the different callings. But this is what I want to go into. He says that there's a danger that some of us would say this. I don't need that part of the body. I don't need the guy that's got wisdom. I don't need that know-it-all. I don't need that guy speaking in tongues. I don't need that. That's for other people. That's not for me. I don't need that. I don't need that discerning of spirits. You know, that guy's all, you know, caught up inside and tied up in circles. And I don't need that. He says there's a danger here that we would say to ourselves, I don't need you. Can the eye say to the foot, I don't need you? Can the ear say to the hand, I don't need you? We need one another, and, and we must be, what, is it pride? Is it woundedness from the past that would leave us in a place that says, you know, I just don't need that. Whatever. I don't need it. Whereas the Lord is calling us to together to bearing with one another, to working with one another, to ministering to one another and receiving it so that we are built up in all the ways that God wants for us to be built up. You know, the very people that might complain that, oh man, there's something wrong with my church are the very people that might not receive from the gifts that are there, right? The point is, is that God has put under the hood of this engine, this church of his, this amazing engine, this amazing bunch of gifts that if it's all available to us, that what happens is that the body of Christ is powerful and mighty. That your gift with my gift, with that gift, with that, with all working together comes forth. God is glorified in ways that we can't even imagine. He's able to do more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power at work within us us. That's not at work in each individual. That's at work in all of us together. Individuals bringing their gifts and being the body together and not resisting because we just know what kind of people they are. Then he says the other problem is this, that one of us might say, uh, I'm not that important to the body. And it's not that important that I'm not there that time. You know, they've got, they got John Shook will be there, you know, and, and you know, John Roger and, and all these other guys, you know, they don't need me. My gift's not all that important, right? And so it's the opposite of the pride and the woundedness. It's the insecurity in the woundedness, you know, where we're walking around thinking that what we bring to the table is just not that important. And so what does Paul go into? He says, look, we need to care for one another and love one another, that we would be the body of Christ in fullness. Does this mean that we're all up in each other's business? You know, that person's trying to control me, you know, and, and you know, they, they're just all up in my business. I don't know, maybe more so than you're comfortable with. But I like the phrases that the Bible uses, that we rejoice with those that rejoice. Are we together enough that when one person rejoices there's a real sense that we are rejoicing with them that we appreciate what they've been going through the hardship they've been facing and when they come through it we're like yes we rejoice and we mourn with those who mourn we recognize wow man that's a real hit for that person and we're able to mourn with those that mourn that we bear one another's burdens that we pray for one another. These are all the one another's of Scripture. You can put it in your, your uh, online concordance, one another in the Bible. And it brings up all these passages that we care for one another, that we practice hospitality with one another, that we serve one another in love, that we love one another, that we greet one another with a holy kiss. Why? Because some of us, the love language is touch. <laughs> Maybe a holy kiss is more important than our cold society that we, you know, leave those that are, that are uh, uh, lonely and, and, and yet their love language is touch and we never think to give them a hug. We never think to give them an embrace and to, to just show them how much we care about them and love them. But the point is, is that God has given us this body 
And there's different gifts. And on any given Sunday, different ones of us might manifest the gifts. But it's very likely that all of us have been wounded in such a way that we find ourselves resistant to the gifts and judgmental. There, that person goes again. Instead of seeing that God has given that gift, and even though they have foibles, God is bringing it forth in glory, and we're a part of helping that to come forth in glory. All of us, I think, do, do this pretty well with our kids, right? Again, we're a generation that has really given us to parenting and identifying the different gifts and callings that are in our kids. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're great at it and doing it with one another. And my appeal this, this morning, just as we're coming to a close, are questions like this. If somebody doesn't make it to a meeting that you made it to, are we close enough that we know what's going on in their lives? We know, oh yeah, man, they've got a fever and they've just really been hurting, you know? Or, yeah, you know, they, they had something that, that, uh, that they had to go do and, and uh, you know, I was really praying for them as they're going to go do it. You know, that, that there's a sense that when people are missing that, that, that we know each other well enough, that, that we care and we're touching each other and we're, we're interacting. Is there a sense that you get to the end of the week and, and you haven't talked to anybody outside of your family? You know, you, there, there hadn't been any texts or any emails or any, any interaction with anybody outside of, of you know, your, your circle. Or is there a sense that, that you did talk to a couple people and you know so-and-so was having a great week and you just were able to touch base and you talked a little bit about deflated footballs, you know? And, and you talk to the other guy and, uh, and you realize that they're really hurting and uh, that they needed some prayer and so you took time to pray for them. Or maybe to even look up a passage of scripture and to, to send them a scripture, right? So that when we come together, Again, there's a sense of knowing, you know, what, what's God doing in our midst? And uh, how can we pray for one another? And does somebody need a word of wisdom? Or, you know, just as we're here together and maybe we don't even know what's been going on, but the Spirit moves on us and we go ahead and step out according to the gift that God puts in us, that we don't poo-poo the gift and say, oh, well, you know, I kind of felt like I should say that, but, you know, I'm probably just, you know, wrong and so I'm not going to say anything at all. Instead of stepping up, or seeing somebody and being bold and praying for them, you know, with a gift of healing about something or this or that. Like, what does it mean for us to, to truly be the body of Christ and to walk in his purposes? So, um, let's stand together just as we come to a close. This series, we hit, John Roger hit so strongly last week about forgiveness. And the week before that, just about you know, what does it mean for us to truly walk in the communion of, of Jesus Christ? Just, just thinking about this from together, I mean, from whatever to together to forever to what does it mean to, to be in faithful relationships with one another? Just as we've been working that through, I want to invite you to search your heart, to ask the Lord to search your heart. What are the barriers that are in you to pressing into closer relationship with others? Is it just the busyness of schedule? And if it is, then what is it that the Lord would have you prune away so that you're able to participate in those kind of relationships? Is it that there's some brokenness in the past and some ways that different people have hurt you and that, that you find yourself shying away from certain people that, that leaves you hesitant uh, at some level or another? God is doing something in our generation. Listen, what he's doing in our generation is right for our generation. We need to not somehow be feeling that we're just bad and horrible. But it is true that there's unique things that our generation faces that you face that are true about others around you. And that as the Lord deals with it in us, he'll prepare us to help them to find hope and encouragement for their lives as well. As we recognize that there's even whole generational kinds of things that we face together as we're growing in family and as we're growing in, in bearing one another's burdens and caring for each other. So let's just pray together.